love and forgiveness. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. It's already interesting the way the worship, the, the, the conversation, the, the things that have happened in Bible study and at breakfast, uh, even picking up my brother at the side of the road today, uh, getting his bike this morning when the battery ran dry after about 20, 25 miles or so of riding. And uh, sometimes our battery runs dry spiritually, Lord, and we just need to come to a place like this where we can gather together as your church and we can get recharged. Father, you have immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine to strengthen us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, continue to move your Holy Spirit here with us. Father, we love you, we worship you, we cry out to you, and we give you praise and thanks for the covering blood of Jesus. Help us to live transformed lives. Help us not to return to the darkness. Help us to find true repentance. Help us to hate sin and love righteousness, but at the same time to love the lost enough that they feel that love and we can help them in the bridge from the journey from darkness into light. We need you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, Richard read for us a, a great verse. I love this verse. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And uh, different versions word it differently, but the one I have here says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine. Now he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about God here. He's saying God can do exceedingly above all we ask or imagine. It's so interesting because our kids, we understand this as parents, our kids will ask us for things and sometimes they're easy demands to meet and sometimes they're a little challenging. But what they don't realize in life is that all we have in store for them, all that we are going to pour out into their lives as parents. Well, God is no different. A matter of fact, he's much greater than that. And the blessings and the direction and the guidance and the love and the abundance of his grace is much more than anything any of us can conceive. So often I think we get so caught up in our worldly life, our life on planet earth, or in just the concept of heaven and hell, we forget that God in his character is one that wants to bless us. That God in his character wants to lead us on a path of love and righteousness and comfort and peace. God uh, is the originator. He is the author of joy. Wow. God wants me to be happy? Yeah, God wants you to be happy. And this verse is packed with meat like that when you really take the time to think about it, that even when we have things to ask God, he hears them before we ask them. He's already got the plan in motion. And as we begin to trust in him and his design, we begin to realize that he has orchestrated a life for us with boundaries and limits that are exactly what we need. Even in the trials, Richard, uh, in our Bible study discussion this morning, it was interesting as, as Richard brought to the plate that one of the blessings listed in the Beatitudes is the blessing of persecution. And I, I didn't ask at the moment because I was wondering, is persecution itself a blessing or is there a blessing that comes to those who are persecuted? And I didn't answer or ask the question and I'll leave that for us to chew on. But do we think of hardship as a blessing? But we realize that the hardship that Christ went through for us is indeed our blessing. That he suffered so that we could be blessed. You know, it says in the conclusion of that verse, it says uh, he does this all that he goes beyond what we could ask or even imagine according to the power that works within us. What is the power that works within Christians? Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. If you prefer that King James uh, type of answer, I'm, I'm with it. The Holy Spirit is the power that works within us. It's not our own power. It's not our own might. It's not our experience. It's not our wisdom. It's not our pedigree, our, our money, our wallet, our degree from college. It's our education. It's not who we were born from. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that makes the difference in every Christian's life. There are rich people that are going to hell. There are experienced people that are going to hell. There are educated people going to hell. There are young people and old people. There are people of diverse races that are going to hell. But that is not what makes the difference in life. It's the Holy Spirit. 
And it's the most important thing that we as Christians need to tap into and be sensitive to. That's what's going to lead us. That's what's going to guide us. It is not a spirit of, pe uh, of fear. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. It directs us, you know, you know where the crazy mind is? Anywhere in the world. You want a sound mind? You've got to tap into the mind of, of, of Christ. And then he says, unto him be glory in the congregation. When you realize that everything good and perfect and pleasing comes from God, it isn't to your glory. It's not to your credit. Even if you accomplish great things in life, even if you are given great opportunities in life, you can always go back to Jesus and say, Lord, God, thank you for this opportunity to serve, to give, to be, to live, to, to be part of this, this journey you've given me. Because ultimately, he is the one that receives the ultimate praise and glory for your situation. Because he could have taken you out at any moment in the game. At any second in your life, you could be taken out of the game. So unto him be the glory in the congregation by Christ Jesus throughout all generations to the age of ages. Amen. So Paul wrote this to the Ephesians. And... Uh, Today we're going to wrap up a series. Our series has, has been basically called New Testament Conversions. So we were looking at, for the last seven weeks, this is the final one today, for the last seven weeks we've been looking at the New Testament, in Acts particularly, to see what conversion looks like. And each sermon kind of added a little bit more to the mystery. What does conversion look like? Because, you know, we live in a world today where they say there's over 2,000 Christian denominations in America alone. And a lot of them say, well, we just go by the book. And so what we've tried to do these last seven weeks is really just go by the book. And not pull out some creed or some piece of history. We've just been going through and looking at the testimonies of people that went from their life of darkness, their life of being lost, into Christ. And we've been comparing their testimony with our own. Well, at least I have been. And thinking, well, is that the experience I had? And we've noticed that they have unique experiences because all of our lives are unique. But we've found some common ingredients, primarily really three, that stood out to me in all of the stories of Acts. Does anybody want to shout out one of those ingredients? What's an ingredient in the conversion of, that seems to be in each one of these testimonies we've seen in Acts these last seven weeks? Repentance. Okay, so Shav says, you know, every one of these guys repented. What does it mean to repent? It means to go from one place and go to the other direction. It's to go the opposite direction a lot of times. It's to get that compass straight again. It's to, to push away the darkness. What is sin? Sin is missing the mark. It's putting yourself on the mark of righteousness again. And so to repent is to, to have a change of mind, to have a mind shift, and to go, you know what? I'm going to go that direction that God wants me to go. Amen. Every one of the conversion stories, every one of your conversion stories, every experience of a true Christian should have the element of repentance. Okay? Change. What makes you want to confess sin? It's a repulsion in yourself. Resisting the Holy Spirit. And you go, you know what? That's something I want to die to. All right, what's another element we saw in all these conversions? Humility. Sorry, I didn't hear it. Humility. Humility. It wasn't one that I drug out through all of them. And absolutely, humility is an aspect of repentance. Why? What is the opposite of humility? Pride. Pride. And what does pride say? I don't need you. I don't need you. I can do it on my own. Humility says, I'm broken. Fix me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, amen. We didn't highlight that in all the series, but I'm looking for three main ones. What was another one? Okay, so they gotta, they got to believe in the message. They've got to accept the message. They've got to accept Christ. Faith has to be element. So they've got to hear the message. They've got to believe the message. They've got to repent. That's their response. And I heard somebody else say? Baptism. baptism. So from there, there's baptism. And we talked about this over and over again. I realize we live in a generation that doesn't highlight baptism, but I'm telling you, it's part of the conversion process in every one of the testimonies. 
even in the demonstration of the life of Jesus himself, he went to be baptized. Why do we think the devil would want to resist such a doctrine? Because it matters. It matters. It's a covenant marker. It's the moment at which you make the covenant. You know what marriage is without the ceremony? Insanity. Adultery. Fornication. Okay? It's not marriage until you do the ceremony. I, I know that's not popular. But if you don't enter into covenant with God through the tool by which he orchestrated, which is baptism, which has a powerful symbolism wrapped around it, then you're just fornicating with God. You're just dabbling with him. You're not doing what he commanded you to do. You're just taking as much of him as you would like. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work in marriage, and it doesn't work in your marriage to God. All right, so we got repentance, we got baptism, we got faith, we got obedience. Now this one, the last one is crucial, and there's nothing that you can do. This is God's part. What is it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's seal. It's his sign of approval. It's his guarantee. It's his token. It's the sanctifying spirit that comes into you and makes life new. It's the element of which when we say I'm born again, it means that I've got a renewed spirit. I left the world. I've been born again of a new spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Christ in you. It is what makes all the difference. And when you're truly born again, that spirit begins to work in you. And he is the author and finisher of your faith. And we've been learning through these series on the sidebar that we need to nurture that spirit. We need to begin to be keen to that spirit, to learn how to listen to that spirit, to grow in that spirit. You know, a lot of churches neglect to preach repentance. Come as you are, stay as you are, and leave as you are. Just throw a little Jesus on it like it's salt. No. God calls us to repentance. Jesus preached repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance. Peter preached repentance. Repentance is all over the Bible. Baptism. A lot of churches don't teach baptism. I'm sorry they don't teach baptism. They want to camp out and say, just faith, just faith, just faith. And I want to tell you, even the demons believe. They don't have any question in their heart whether God exists or not. Yeah. Faith moves you to do something. Real faith orchestrates work. So God calls us through the waters of baptism, which have a rich symbolism. It symbolizes, according to the Bible, and this will be the last verse we hit today, not right now, but at the end, which will be Romans 6, 1-4, and, and that is that baptism symbolizes the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Wrapped into that is not just a, a ritual. It's not just something ritualistic. It's the idea that Jesus died for you he was buried. He suffered the consequences of men's sin, your sin, my sin, all of our sin. And Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, was resurrected from the dead. And he calls us all to participate in the death of the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We participate in his death by dying to our worldly, earthly, despicable, carnal self. We repent. And we're buried with him in baptism and we're raised again and sealed by his Holy Spirit. That message of baptism is so much more than just some ritual, some, some water uh, thing. It, it, embedded in it is a gospel message that has been there from the beginning. And it's preached over and over again in Acts. Do not take my word for it. Search the scriptures. See if the things that I am saying are true. Amen. So today we're going to simply look at the Ephesians. And it's going to wrap up our series. We could have kept going, but I think seven was enough. And in Ephesians, we see the birth of the church. And I want to get that testimony. And so we're going to go to Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7.
I don't know, might be fun. Anybody want to read that passage? Stand up, read it with a good, strong voice for us. Acts 19, 1 through 7. Anybody in the spirit for that? There he is. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism were you baptized with? He asked them. With John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in other languages and to prophesy. Now there were about 12 men. Amen. So Paul runs across these 12 guys in Ephesus, and the Bible tells us that they're disciples. When we hear the word disciple, for some of us, we just think those are the 12. It's like we equate disciples with just the people that Jesus had. Well, the word disciple literally means teach, uh, t uh, student. It's a follower. It's an imitator. It's, it, it, it can be you. It can be me. It could be the 12 that got the name as apostles later of Jesus, but also John the Baptist had disciples. And so the disciples of John the Baptist were people that believed in the message that John the Baptist was preaching, and they followed him. They imitated him. In one place in, I think, John chapter 4 or 3, it says they even began to help him do baptisms. Okay. And so, and, and, and when Paul runs across these disciples, if you remember, what, who was John the Baptist? As a matter of fact, that's what people like to ask him when they met him. Who are you? Are you the Messiah? What did John say? No. 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 Uh, are you a prophet? He didn't give a clear answer to that too. Well, are you Elijah? Who are you? And does anybody remember what he says? That's exactly right, Shav. He says, I am the one who God has called to prepare the way for the Lord. Okay? So that was his job. His job, his ministry, what Jesus and, and God and the whole orchestration of God's plan was that John would come and he would prepare the way. And so he begins to prepare the way by doing what? He calls people to repentance. Come, repent, get ready for the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. Come, repent. His time is coming. He is coming soon. You need to repent. Come and repent. And people would come and they'd get baptized and, and they'd show their repentance. And, and, and some people came for the spectacle. Do you remember who it was that came for the spectacle? It was the religious, the super religious. It was some Pharisees. And John's reply to them is, who warned you of the wrath to come? You brood of vipers, you snakes. Show works. Show a lifestyle of repentance. Show works worthy of repentance. Because repentance is real. Repentance is not a show. It's not a face you put on. It's a true transformation of life. And so these guys were disciples of John. They were zealous. They were looking for the Messiah. They wanted a piece of Jesus in their life. They, they had been hearing John talk about this one is coming, that the kingdom is coming, that the Messiah is coming, that this is the age, this is the moment in time when God has orchestrated for the transition of life to occur, for men to finally find salvation. And these guys were like, yes, we want it. We follow you. We're with you. Baptize us. Lead us. Guide us. We want to be part of this movement. And Paul finds these guys and he asks them, do you have the Holy Spirit? And they're like, uh, what do you mean? We haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Their faith is incomplete. They've got a part of the message. And they've got the spirit. I mean, I, I, what I mean by spirit there is small less. They've got the zeal. They've got the drive. They've got the character. They've got the desire to do uh, the right thing. But th their, their, their faith hasn't been completed. 
Because your faith is not completed without the Holy Spirit. You can do all the things in the world you can think you can accomplish. You could repent and have great faith and you could study the Bible and memorize scriptures and, and be the best little Christian church person you could be. But if you are not sealed with the gift of God's spirit, you are not part of his kingdom. Amen. It's the absolute truth teller to it all. Because we don't earn our salvation. He marks our salvation through the blood of Jesus and forgiveness and the granting of the guarantee, which is the Holy Spirit. And so Paul meets these guys and he says, do you have the Holy Spirit? And they're like, we don't even know about a Holy Spirit. And it's not time to condemn them. It's not time to go, well, oh, you're so bad. I can't believe you didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. No, Paul says, well, what then were you baptized to? Do you see the correlation being brought out here in Acts? It's putting a correlation between receiving the Spirit and baptism. They're like, well, we were baptized to John's baptism. And Paul says, well, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. But when Jesus came, he brought a baptism that brings with it a promise. And that promise is one. You will be covered by the blood of Jesus. Your sins will be wiped away and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise. And they're like, wow, we want it. And the Bible tells us they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wasn't John's baptism enough? No. It wasn't enough. So when is a baptism enough? When you get the Holy Spirit. Right before you drown. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, when you get the Holy Spirit, it's the answer I, I was hoping for that Shav gave. But, but Mike says, right before you drown. And, and the truth is, a baptism is enough right before you drown because what happens in baptism is supposed to be the death of your old self. Okay. And so baptism does have a, a symbolism that is rich. And you might say, I, I meet some people and, and, and they go, well, I don't know. It, boy, you're, you're showing me scriptures I never saw. You know, I, I saw this happen with some people even in this congregation. I, I, I'm seeing things I never saw before. I was baptized before. But it was like an outward show to an inward faith. And it had no, I never thought of it as a covenant. I never thought of it as the operating place where God was going to meet me in the middle. I, I, I never thought of it as, as that covenant marker that meant that now I'd come under the blood of Jesus, that all my sins have been washed away by the blood and the power of what Jesus did on the cross and that God would seal me with the Holy Spirit. I haven't even heard it this way. And I usually talk to people that feel that way and I show them the scriptures and then I ask them, did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believed? Has your life been transformed? Are you born again? And at times we find out. Some people are like, you know what? Let's go. I want to go back. I want to do this right. I don't want to play around. I want my covenant with Jesus. Is that a rebaptism? Were the disciples of John rebaptized here? No. No, it was their first baptism into Christ. And later, Paul, if you remember uh, Ephesians well enough, he says, There's one Lord, one faith, one spirit, one body, one baptism. baptism. He needs to enforce this in Ephesus because they, they did have a, a foundation that was built on John's ministry. And John's ministry was awesome. And it was good. It was the transition ministry. It was the call of God. But it didn't have the packing of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Why? Because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Oh, the Holy Spirit was resident in Christ. The fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. He told the disciples, the Spirit has been with you, but after I'm gone and rise, the Holy Spirit will be in you. John couldn't be a distributor of the Holy Spirit. John was beheaded before Jesus was ever arrested. 
John knew nothing about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. John called men to repentance, which is great. And I'm afraid there's a lot of churches, that's all they do is call men to repentance. But they don't equip them with the power or the opportunity to find one, true forgiveness, and two, something that will enable them to live a transformed life. Have you ever tried to walk the tightrope of being perfect? It's awfully hard. And you never win. Eventually you fall off the rope. You're going to fall off the rope. In some way or fashion, you cannot be perfect. But through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the cleansing blood of Jesus, in the eyes of God, you can be perfect. You can be mature and you can be made mature through that Holy Spirit. It's an absolute. It's not something you could leave on the side. The Holy Spirit was not yet given in the time of John because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Uh, one more thought I want to throw on this is that this morning I thought about this. There are so many lies. You know, I mentioned 2,000 denominations also. We could spend classes and classes and classes tearing down the lies of false doctrine. And it would take a lifetime. The devil has made it so that he'll just throw so many lies out there that if you go around like a fireman trying to put out all these fires of the lies, you will exhaust yourself trying to tear down lies. But if you simply find and preach and teach and live the truth, that's the answer. Because that's something all of us can do. Just go for the truth. Go for the truth. Preach the truth. Find the truth. Believe in the truth. Study the scriptures. And they are the truth. Let them be your truth. There's lots of wise men out there. There's lots of great orators. There's lots of people that can give you convincing proofs. But let this be your truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. This has got to be your truth. And that's why I say, don't take my word for it. Look it up. Yeah. So what if we've lived in a generation that's preached lies for 200 years? The truth will stand. The truth will come through it all. God will raise up his remnant, his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church. God has had a church since the day he started it on, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. His spirit is living here on earth today and is alive and well and it's doing great. I'll, I can guarantee you that his spirit... From Scripture, I know it's alive and well. And not only that, the Scripture teaches us that the day that that spirit is pulled back is the day when the calamity begins. That's when it's all over. It's not a day of mediocrity. You know, literally the question that Paul asks is unto what? In some of your Bible versions, uh, then were you baptized? It, it, that, that, that phrase... In uh, Greek, it means unto what or into who? I actually prefer the into who. Into who were you baptized? Were you baptized into John? Were you baptized into repentance? No, you're baptized into Christ. You become a wearer of the family name. It says, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptize them into the name of Jesus Christ. There's no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. Yeshua, God, is salvation. We've got to come into his name. When you're married, you share a name, usually. I know it's a different world, but traditionally, when you get married, one of the significant things that happens is you bear the same name. Yeah. And, and, and in the Bible, the, the church is compared to a, a wife. And so in our world, generally, a wife will take the name of the husband. And she gets the reputation of the husband. She gets the fame and the control and the power. And, and she sits under the roof of that protective boundary of the husband now. In Christ, when we take his name, it's all those same kinds of pictures that we should see is that we're taking the name of Jesus. We, take, uh, we come under the umbrella, to, uh, uh, umbrella of his authority. And how vast is his authority? 
When he rose from the dead, he said, All power and authority has been given unto me. I want to be under his name. In his name. Amen. So this brings me to this other guy, Apollos. So I taught the one story. I, I, I did it on purpose. We're going to go back in time a little bit to Acts 18.24. I did this on purpose because I wanted you to see what it meant to be a disciple of John compared to a disciple of Jesus before we discussed what happened with Apollos. So Paul gets to Ephesus and he's preaching the gospel and then he takes off to Corinth. But while he's in Corinth, a ministry couple in the church, their names are Aquila and Priscilla. Well, they meet this guy named Apollos. And Apollos is this amazing Jewish guy from Alexandria down in Egypt. And while he was down in Alexandria in Egypt, which is the, uh, the first century world of, of education, it's the place where the great Alexandrian libraries were. It was the place where some of the greatest minds. It's the place where the Bible in Hebrew was translated into Greek. I mean, it, it, it was the center of intellect. And so Apollos is this Jewish guy that comes out of that environment, living and growing up there, but he only understands the baptism of John. And so let's read about him. In Acts chapter 18, verse 24, it says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man. Some of you have the, the Bible, it says eloquent man. The word means either of those things. In, in Greek. He had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. Now, mind you, the scriptures that we know and hold dear, the new, new covenant, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. So when it says that, it's talking about he had a very good control. Uh, he had a, a thorough knowledge of, of the Old Testament, as we call it, or if you want, the First Testament. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord is a catchphrase. John the Baptist came to prepare the way. the way of the Lord. Every time you see the way of the Lord used, it's in reference to that ministry segment of time. You can check that out. And he spoke with great fervor. The Bible here uses a, a, a Greek word. It, it says he spoke with a boiling spirit. Uh that word fervor is interesting. It, it means to sizzle. It's, uh, the, the Greek word is zeal. Zzz. Those who work in a kitchen, what does that sound like? Zzz. Sizzle. Sizzle. That's where the word sizzle comes from. Zeo. Okay. And, and the word is what we call onomatopoetic. Have it, you English majors? Onomatopoeia or onomatopoetic. What, what does onomatopoeia mean? So a word that sounds like what it is. Anybody, can anybody think of a word like that? Bang. bang. Okay, bang. Okay, <laughs> good one. So in Greek, zeo, when the, when the Greeks heard the word zeo, they were thinking of that sizzling sound. And so the Bible here is talking about the fervor, the spirit of Apollos. And they said, man, he's like that boiling, he's like that zzzz, you know, when you put a bacon or, you know, probably wasn't bacon because they were Jews. But when you put something with grease in the pot, you know, zzzz, and, and they're like, when Apollos speaks, it's like zzzz. And they were, they were captivated by him. He was an amazing speaker. And he taught about Jesus accurately. Although... He only knew the baptism of John. So his teaching about Jesus only went that far. It, it, it says he only knew, in the Greek it means he only stood upon the baptism of John. He had only gotten that far in his faith. He, he understood that John preached that Jesus was coming. He understood that John preached that Jesus was the Lamb of God. He understood that John preached that Jesus would be the sacrifice of sin for all mankind. But he didn't quite have it all. He didn't quite understand that Jesus would die. He would be buried and that he would resurrect from the dead. That Jesus would come with a promise that within him bodily dwelt the fullness of the Godhead and that when he would be resurrected he would release that spirit to fall on his church. That was all unfamiliar to him as we see from the disciples of John that, that Paul just dealt with later. He knew only the baptism of John. 
He began to speak boldly in the, in the synagogue, regardless of the fact he didn't have the complete message. Regardless of the fact that he was only halfway to being a Christian, he was still fervent. He was still on fire. He was still bringing people out of that old covenant, that, that first covenant. He was telling them that there's a new covenant for you to experience. There's a new reality in, in your walk with God. There's, there's a way that you quite haven't found yet. You've got to understand that the way of God is not quite what you've been used to. That God wants to bring you out into something that gives life. But it was still halfway. <coughs> he didn't have it all. And he was disrupting the synagogue. Because those who weren't embracing John the Baptist, they're not embracing Apollos. They're not embracing Christianity. They're not embracing any of it. But he's bold enough to go in there and speak what he, the truth he knows. He's bold enough to uh, release uh, his, his knowledge that he's gained and to give it to others. He's, he thinks it's important enough that he won't keep it to himself. And he, he does this. And, and Priscilla and Aquila, that, that couple I mentioned, they were a ministry couple that Paul had met. And Aquila was a tent maker. And, and they were an amazing ministry couple. They weren't... Uh, necessarily uh, people that we read a lot about in the Bible. Uh, we find out later that a lot of times the church meetings happened in their house. They were wealthy. They were in Rome. And when they're in Rome, Claudius came to reign. And at one point, Ju uh, Claudius said, you know what? The Jews are a disruption to the Roman society. We need them to get out. And, the, and, the, and there was a pogrom and there was pressure and the Jews were pushed out of Rome. And one of the couples that got pushed out was Aquila and Priscilla. And they team up with Paul for a little while because they're all tent makers. And Aquila and Priscilla are kind of under the tutelage of Paul for a little while. And they grow in their faith and they're strong. And they're good, what I call house church leaders. Because they know how to invite people into their home and show them the gospel. They know to work, how to work as a team. When I think of Davina, we're a team, we're a unit. You know, you, you, you didn't just get Jeff Fisher, thank God. You, you got Davine also, okay? Because we work together as a team. We're like that, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, Davine is hospitality major. You know, she, she knows how to, to love people and make people feel taken care of. And if you haven't experienced that in, in your life from her yet, just reach out to her because she wants to pour it on you. She's got more to go around. That's how she had six kids. And we would have had more if the Lord had willed, but that's how it went. And so this is that couple. I want you to feel, you know, their hearts. They're full of zeal and they're full of hunger to, to help people on their journey to Christ. And, and so they invited them, it says, when they heard him speak, when they heard that zzz, and, they, and they saw his fervor and they saw his desire and they, they saw that he just stood on the, the level of John's baptism, that he didn't have the full understanding of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When they saw that, that his, his faith was incomplete, that the Holy Spirit wasn't resident, they said, hey, come on into our home. They didn't embarrass him. They didn't stand up in the synagogue and go, dude, you got half the message. You know, people can walk into our assembly. And, and we have grown in the Lord. And we realize that there are some people that are really trying on their path to Christianity, but they only have half the truth. And we can straight arm them and be intimidated by them and think that they've come to hurt us. Or we could look at them like Apollos and go, wow, they have all this zeal already. They've come all this far. What can we do to help them complete or further their journey with Christ? Instead of being intimidated, instead of being afraid of people that have partial truth, we actually use that as a foundation stone to build further truth. Yeah. And that's the example of the Bible. So here he is in their home, and it says, They explained to him the way of God more adequately. They sat down with him, said, Apollos, you're a wise guy. You're smart. Look at the scriptures here and let us tell you what happened with Jesus. Jesus went on to die. And it wasn't a mistake. Jesus willingly died on the cross for your sins. He paid a price you couldn't pay, Apollos. 
He did something for you you could never do. You can never walk that tightrope. Jesus walked it. Jesus walked the tightrope. And death had no authority over him. Because he had never sinned, death had no right to enter into his life. But he died so that you could live. He took your penalty so that you could live free. And when the court cases are open, and they say, the problem with you, Davine, is you're self-righteous. The problem with you, Davine, is that you uh, ignore people sometimes. The problem with you, Davine, is that you covet. And the Lord steps in and goes, nope, that was my problem. She's as clean as a whistle. Because she's under the blood of Jesus. And they taught this to Apollos. And do you know how much he ate it up? He ate it up a lot. You know how I know that? Because the very final verse of that chapter, verse 28, it says, after he gets a hold of this message, he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate. From that point, he said, let's bring it. He didn't just bring it to the synagogue. He's like, bring it on, bring it on. And it says he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. He was so good at his handle on the word of God that he could get it. He would open the book and he'd just say, you know, I know you believe this and that and this and such, but let me tell you, this is the truth. He absorbed himself into the Word of God to such a point that they had no chance. Because this is our tool. And if you know it well enough, you can't argue with the truth. You can argue all you want, but you can't win. And Apollos was a winner because he went on the side of the truth. Amen. You know, later, Apollos went on to help lead the church in Ephesus and the church in Corinth. And it, it created an interesting dynamic because these were churches that Paul planted and later Apollos watered. So Paul went in and planted, but Apollos watered. You ever hear that? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. And they became a team. They became a team. What part of the team are you playing on? Are you a planter? Awesome. Meet some new fresh souls and plant seeds in their heart. Are you a waterer? Are you grabbing people somewhere on their journey already and you're watering them and trying to bring them to Christ? Amen. That's a great place to be. Ultimately, it's God that will seal the deal. It is God that will put his mark of approval on a person. How much does God want to put his mark of approval on a person? Do we believe in selective grace? That God only chooses some people and doesn't choose the rest? Is that what we're going to teach? Is that what we're going to see in the scriptures? Or are we going to hear the verse that says, For God so loved the world. Or another verse that says, God does not desire that any should perish. And so you can be assured that when you're reaching out to somebody that that's somebody God wants to save. Yeah. He wants to save that person. You have his full permission to plant seeds in their heart and water them. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be saved, but it's not going to be at the fault of God. No one's going to stand at the judgment seat and say, I didn't go to heaven because you didn't elect me to go to heaven, God. And that's another doctrine floating around. But you've got to stretch the word to do those doctrines. Know your scriptures. I'm going to end, like I said, with Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's in the middle of an argument here about people who think because they have grace they can just go on sinning. Amen, we have grace and we will go on sinning. But is, is it a deliberate sin? Is it a purposeful sin? Is it you're warring against the Holy Spirit in you sin? Hopefully not. The Holy Spirit is planted in you to transform you, to make you new, to be born again, to be the butterfly, to go from being the caterpillar to the butterfly. It's to change you. And if we want to nurture the sin in our life and keep the character of the dead man and try to always be resuscitating our old carnal self, what good is that? Yeah. 
And it's an insult to the spirit of grace. It's an insult to what God has planted and sealed in you. You must resist sin. Not for your salvation, but because you know it hurts God. And it hurts you. Shall we sin then because we have grace? Absolutely not is the answer. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live in it any longer? Don't you know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? That's, that's what it's about. When you're baptized, it's not just a water ritual. It's not just a church membership club. It's coming into Christ. It's saying, Lord, I want you to be the shepherd over my life. I want your name. I don't want my name. I don't want my reputation. I don't want my character. I don't want my life. I don't want anything that I have built with the life you gave me because I took it and I ruined it like the prodigal stun. I took everything of your wealth, God, and I ruined it. And by your mercy, if you're willing, God, would you just give me a new name? And he says, I'm willing. Come to the water. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. How are we buried? By baptism. Find in me where the scripture says we're buried by a sinner's prayer. I'll give you $25,000 <laughs> out of Mike's bank account. <laughs> no, it's just not there. But like I said, we could go chasing the lies that are preached to us. Or we could camp on the truth. I want to camp on the truth because there's too many lies. The lies, man, the devil produces lies at 100 miles an hour. There's new doctrines, new churches, new ideas, new concepts coming out all the time. Let's just stick to the, to the straight and narrow. This gospel that you're hearing this morning, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to repent and be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit has been preached since the very beginning. It was straight out of the very first sermon in Acts that Jesus died he died for your sins. He was buried. He was crucified. That he carried the penalty of your death, of your sinful life. And he did it because of his love. And that he was resurrected. And by the power of that spirit, he has a promise for you. That you too could be born again. Paul goes on to say, Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. That's, that's the born again life. That's the transformed life. A new life. A new way of doing things. We left behind that life of darkness. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the resurrection. If. What does if mean? We've asked this before. Conditional statement. Conditional. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. Have you been planted together with Christ in the likeness of his death? How are we planted together with Christ in the likeness of his death? According to scripture, right here, we were buried with him by baptism. Does baptism save you? No. no. No, it's the working of God in that covenant. Does your marriage contract make a marriage? Yes, no. Yeah, now you're officially married. If you didn't have it, you wouldn't be. But it doesn't make a marriage. Love makes a marriage. So in baptism, does it save you? Yes, no. It's not magic water. It's not a secret potion. But it's a covenant. It's what God has called you to. To come down into the water. And it's richly symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you participate in that, he's going to operate on his end of the deal. He'll keep his half of the covenant. Actually, his 99.999% of the covenant because what you have to offer is very little. It's called, all you have to offer is your existence, which he actually gave to you. For if we have been planted together in his likeness of his death, we shall also be in his resurrection. We get to go in the resurrection because God's going to collect up his spirit one day. And when he collects up his spirit, that's called collecting up the church. 
He brings his bride to himself. It's the great marriage of the Lamb. It's speak, spoken about in different places. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. It's through baptism. Our old man's put on the cross. Yeah, there's a lot of mental thinking stuff, real repentance, character analysis that has to go on your art. It's not the ritual of the water. When it becomes the ritual of the water, it loses its effect. When it's just the ritual of the water, you don't come out with the Holy Spirit. God doesn't attach His promise to somebody who's not truly repentant. God doesn't attach His promise to somebody who has no faith. God doesn't attach His promise to somebody whose Christianity is only halfway marked. And they don't want to go any further. That we should no longer be enslaved to sin. I think the most evident thing that we see in a Christian's life is that steady progression of freedom. When I meet people and they say I'm a Christian, I'm like, great, man, that's awesome. You know, and we get talking. I'm looking for the transformed life. Is your life transformed? Because if it's not, we got to do some repair work somewhere. Maybe you're like Apollos. Maybe you've only come halfway. Maybe something needs to be corrected. Because God came to transform your life. And if you're still wrestling in the same things and have not changed, we've got to address it. We've got to work on it together as a team. Amen. Today I want to offer the opportunity. We have a baptismal here. If this message has touched you in a certain way in which you feel as if, hey, I might kind of be one of those incomplete people. I'm not sure that I even know about the Holy Spirit the way you've taught it, the way I've seen it and heard it in the scriptures today. Then I want to offer for you today that opportunity. And you can come up to me uh, during service uh, right here at the end, or you can approach uh, myself or my wife or, or Josiah or whoever you can grab a hold of and say, you know what, I need a couple minutes with you to talk about my journey with Christ. I, I want to complete it. I, I, I don't want to be halfway. I want to go the whole way with him. And uh, let's take some time together, uh, you know, and just, we just got to know, though. We got to know that that's your need. And we'll, we'll make sure that you don't leave this place without the blessings of God. Because God wants to save every soul that is willing and humble and comes to him with a repentant heart. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this attentive crowd. Thank you for your word that pierces the darkness. Thank you for your truth that stands no matter the lie. And thank you, God, that in the end, it's not what I say, it's what you say, Father. It's what is lifted up in your word, God, that we can search the scriptures and find them and we can find Jesus. We can find that son that you sent for us in those scriptures. Direct us, Lord, in the paths of righteousness and in truth. Lead and guide us into all truth. Seal us with the power of your Holy Spirit and cleanse us with your sin. Father, thank you for your cleansing blood through the, through the power of what Jesus did for us on the cross. God, cover us and help us to grow and be transformed. And Lord, help us to find others. Help us not to hide this pearl of great price. Help us not to hide our light under a bushel or or tuck it away somewhere. Help us to share it with others. This is a dying world, Father, and help us to have compassion and mercy and love and, and feel sorry for the people that are lost. Help us to reach out. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we sing all